We got you. We got you. And more to come. Clown, thug, crook, criminal. <laughs> this isn't this isn't a fake video, people. This guy sounds like Michael Rappaport <laughs> without the swearing. <laughs> so I just want everybody to appreciate. That's not a doctored video. That is straight up. You can see it in, you can't see the banner, but a refresh. That is straight up from Jamal Bowman's official Twitter account. I thought it was a joke. I'm like, no, this, this can't be real. This cannot be a congressman <laughs> acting <laughs> like a fool. I mean, there's a, the ultimate irony behind this because when the video of Jamal Bowman, no, sorry, when he got arrested or charged with pulling the fire extinguisher, fire alarm, I was like, oh, maybe I can find something that shows what a hypocrite Jamal Bowman is. Um, I found it. This is his official account. He's laughing at the Trump mugshot. Ah. <laughs> Fool. Criminal. We got you. We got you. Justice. We got you. And more to come. More to come. Clown. Clown. Thug. Thug. Hmm. Crook. Crook. Criminal. <laughs> All right. Well, th so the ultimate irony, people is um, not, not, not much time later, uh, Jamal Bowman, the man who, at, who couldn't tell what the fire alarm was and thought it was a, an emergency exit, apparently, the video of his lie comes out. He comes in there. This is the video of Jamal Bowman pulling the uh, fire alarm. Takes the two signs down. I don't know why he did that. And pulls the alarm. You remember his official explanation? I wanted to personally clear up some confusion surrounding today's events. Today, as I was rushing to make a vote, I came to a door that is usually open for votes, but today would not open. I'm embarrassed to admit that I activated the fire. Liar. Remember when he called Trump a crook, criminal, thug? Liar. And now I want to see your mugshot because rules are rules, Jamal. You made them. I'm mistakenly thinking it would open the door. I regret this and sincerely apologize. Oh, yeah. But I want to be very clear. This was not in any way me trying to deliver. Liar. This is him. Here, look at this. Comes up in a rush. I thought this door would open. Oh, the sign, by the way, says, I'll show you what the sign says because I couldn't read it. Someone found, oh, there you go. Pull the alarm and run. What did the alarm say? What did the sign say? Sorry, hold on one second. Here you go. Someone, uh, amp I hope this is right. Hold for three, push until alarm sounds. Three seconds, doors will unlock in 30 seconds. Doesn't seem like a very safe emergency exit. Liar. And now he's been charged with a very minor, a minor charge. So maybe he is still laughing all the way to the bank because apparently, you know, rules for thee, but not for me or whatever the hell it is. No one's above the law, but some people are certainly more under the law than others. Oh, yes, sir. Public Square people. That's right. This is going to be amazing. I ran into Michael at uh, Tim Pool's event in Miami, and it's... It is what the world needs right now by way of business. And I'll, straight up, this is not a sponsored ad. There's no, there's, no hit, there's no financial anything here. I met Michael. He has created a business which is fascinating but responding to a need that we all need right now. A parallel economy. And I got some questions because I got some questions as to how this all works. But he started Public Square, which he'll explain it. He'll explain it. And then I invited him on. He said, sure, let's do it. And then we bumped around some scheduling time and... Boom shakalaka, here we are. But before we actually go live, let me make sure we're live on the Rumbles. We are. There we go. That's my ugly face right there. And let me see if we're live on the Locals. VivaBarnsLaw.Locals.com. Live here. And I'll wait for an answer. We are. And if anybody wants to go watch on VivaBarnsLaw.Locals.com, we're going to have the after party there. That's the link. And if anybody wants to go watch on Rumble... I think I forgot one thing today, which was link to Rumble. And there's a typo in there because it's me. All right. How do I, how do I go pin that comment before we leave here? Pin the comment. Okay, done. Done and done. And Michael's in the backdrop. We're getting this on. Everybody share the link. We're live. And Michael, bringing you in in three, two, I'm just, I, I, one second too early. Michael, sir, how goes the battle? It's going. It's going indeed. It's good to be here. 
Well, it's good to have you. I love the I love the organic way that you know you meet people who are good people who do good things, and then things just just happen. Thirty thousand foot overview. I will not spend too much time on your childhood. I got a lot out of you uh, during the uh, Tim event, but I might ask you some questions. Who are you? What are you doing? And how is life? I am Michael Seifert. I and my team have built the largest marketplace in the world of non-woke businesses that aren't going to lecture you about gender ideology when you're just trying to buy a cup of coffee. And I'm doing really well. I'm uh, loving change in the country through the power of commerce. We're shifting the power structures of society back toward we the people at publicsq.com. And it can happen by helping consumers vote with their wallet. If you're tired of what Target and Bud Light and these other entities are doing, you actually have options where you can shift your dollars elsewhere. It's not just enough to boycott. We can actually move our money positively in a direction that we feel good about. And so uh, I'm, I'm filled with hope. The world's kind of collapsing and Rome is falling, but... We're having fun. Joyful resilience at the end of the day. <laughs> um, someone cynically said, you know, when World War III goes off, at least, you know, the ratings, are, the ratings on TV are going to be good. Um, may I, I won't pry too much into childhood and upbringing, but may I ask, like, where are you from, siblings, what your parents do, and, and just to understand how you got to where you are now. I'm from Southern California. That's where I've lived the longest over the course of my life. But actually recently just moved to the sunny state of Florida. So I'm like you, uh, fled uh, communism, the People's <laughs> Republic of California. And we're, we consider ourselves political refugees. So we made the move to Florida. It was actually funny. The other evening, my wife and I were sitting in a restaurant uh, with our sweet little girl. And uh, we were having a great dinner. Our waitress was really kind. She said, hey, have you ever been here? We said, no, are we actually just moved. She said, where'd you move from? We said, California. She goes, oh, no. <laughs> and I said, I promise we're the good kind. And uh, we're not going to vote for the same sort of policies that decimated that once beautiful state. So we are proud Florida residents now. We love the free state of Florida. And my parents are actually from both of them from farming families in central Illinois. And uh, they decided to go on a little bit of an adventure when they got married. And so they moved around the country with us as my dad had new promotional opportunities with his job. And uh, so I saw a lot of the country and and learned a lot of stories along the way. I've always been intrigued by politics and business. And so now the fact that what I do actually blends those two worlds, it's quite rewarding. So uh, we have a wonderful family, a wonderful purpose-filled profession, and uh, I get to meet lots of cool Americans. So now, it's an exciting life. You, so you were born in Illinois or were you born and raised in California? I was actually born in Kentucky. And you'll like this, a portion of my upbringing was in Toronto, Canada. So while I've lived in California the longest, I'm from a lot of different places. And so I lived just south of Toronto for a few years of my childhood and uh, made the move back to the United States for high school. And uh, yeah, it's it's been a wild ride, but I feel like Florida's home for a while. So it's pretty refreshing to feel like Flor we're settling roots. It, other than, I, I don't want to poo-poo the architecture or the lack. I mean, it's sort of like all very similar structured buildings, strip malls and all that stuff. If you can get past that and the flatness and the hotness, it's a beautiful place. People are... I mean, as far as I can tell, genuinely and sincerely happy here. Uh, and it's tough not to be happy when it's sunny every day of the week and you're not being taxed out the wazoo. California is sunny every day, pretty much, but you're taxed up the wazoo. Uh, born in Kentucky. How many years did you spend in Kentucky? Four. Okay, so you don't really remember Kentucky. Don't remember. Then you go up to Toronto? Uh, St. Louis for a year and then Toronto. Okay. We were in Toronto for almost five and then made the move back. <clears throat> for uh, then was in St. Louis, Florida, California, Alabama for a little while, and then California for basically my entire 20s. Well, let me ask you this. This is a lot of travel for a kid. Um, how many siblings do you have? One, younger sister. So, she actually works at Public Square as well. Uh, it's, that's amazing. It's the, good, it's the good kind of nepotism, I promise. Uh, <laughs> she, she, this is a meritocracy around here. She earns her keep and she does a fantastic job uh, as a product designer. So we're, we're grateful to have uh, my younger sister, Katie, on board. Well, now, traveling around that much as a kid has got to be difficult for developing roots, making friends. There's, a, there's the flip side is you make a lot of friends in a lot of places and you've got a lot of great connections, but you don't appreciate that as a child. Do you harbor any resentment to your parents for the, uh, not tumultuous, but the, what's the word? Not transitory either, but the, the, the traveling you did as a kid, which you probably did not like as a kid? Yeah, it was difficult being a nomad. We never really felt settled. And yet at the same time, I was grateful right around the time I was about 13 or 14, I started feeling an immense sense of gratitude for the diversity of relationships I formed. I had friends all over the country and truly over the continent. And uh, doing all that travel also helped shape a lot of my social abilities. 
I, I think that one thing that's really hurting the next generation is the lack of ability to connect with each other. We're glued to our phones. We're glued to our screens. And uh, if you've never really been forced to get outside your comfort zone as it relates to social interaction, you're really handicapped in that regard. And uh, I know that now our team is filled with incredible staff members, many of whom are Gen Zers, but they're the anomaly compared to many of their peers. Many of their peers in this day and age can't even lock eye contact. It's actually very sad to watch. And so part of the travel and the moving around and the transit nature of our family actually helped instill in me a, a great sense of uh, um, the ability to communicate, the ability to create relationships very quickly, the ability to move past small talk quickly, to jump into deep conversation, and uh, also the ability to transition well. I think one thing that people have a hard time too with is maintaining relationships long distance, and we were able to do that growing up. So I'm grateful all in all, net, very much a net positive. Um, how old are you, if I may ask? 28. So 20, okay, fine. So you're growing up uh, with this highly movable life, but it's in the digital age. So it really does change everything. It's like, mm -hmm. you didn't have to rely on writing letters and pen pals to maintain friendships. It's, it could be as direct as the internet. Okay, what did you study in university? Political science. All right, and any, bi it. any business after that or just political science straight into this? So I took a unique approach coming out of high school. Uh, I graduated high school and uh, my father was actually very much into finance. And so taught me a lot about personal finance as well as corporate finance, taught me a lot about the way that the economy works and uh, understood a lot of how economic structures shape society and then vice versa, how society and policy shapes economic structures. I, I loved it growing up. I, I grew up reading people like John Locke and Thomas Paine and learning a lot about social structures and the public square and what makes a community thrive, learning the difference between a republic and a democracy and that we truly are a constitutional republic and why that's so important to preserve. I just loved soaking all this up as a kid. And so when I graduated, I actually wanted to get to work right away. I did a year of traditional schooling, went to University of Alabama, did a, a year in person and just didn't really feel like the in-person college experience was for me. I wanted to go work. I wanted to get my hands dirty and actually jump in and put some of the practical skills I had learned to work. So I left school in person. I went to online schooling through Liberty University and I actually graduated my entire bachelor's degree with a major and a minor online. I never actually stepped foot on the Liberty campus. I did it all online before online school was cool and uh, was really grateful to graduate while I got to work full time. So I worked in nonprofits, I worked also in uh, private equity, and I got to do that working with small business owners and different entrepreneurs all while I was doing school at night. And that really set me up well for what I'm doing today. So I'm grateful for the degree, uh, but more than anything, I'm grateful for the practical application. Many other countries do this, by the way. They encourage their high school students to start flexing their muscles within a specific profession or school of thought earlier than later. And that way, when you actually graduate and you head into your professional career, you're not just looking at 18 as the transition to more schooling. You're actually looking at 18 as sort of the age where you transition into providing value to society. And that's what I wanted to do. So uh, now we're here and, you know, it's, it's worked. Um, I, I've never really let the age thing hold me back. Uh, I've, I've loved to go and work and build and try to provide value. Uh, I found out last week I'm the youngest CEO of a publicly traded company, which I didn't know. Uh, but that's that's kind of fascinating as well. So hopefully I'm just at the beginning of this lifelong journey to providing value and helping change societies through commerce. It's cool. Let me ask the crass question because there's a you know a big debate about the cost of university in America. You do an online uh, university education at Liberty. What did it cost? Gosh, I think I think my per semester cost with no scholarships or anything because it was an, an online school that was pretty simple. Uh, I think my semester costs all in was like $6,500. So my yearly tuition was less than 13, 14 grand. Uh, it was a very cost effective way to do schooling. It was actually affordable. Uh, and I took a lot of classes. I kind of expedited the journey and the path there. So I tried to cram a lot in in a short amount of time. I highly recommend it. It was an amazing world-class curriculum too. Your teachers will call you every week. Uh, I, you know, Liberty University is a Christian school as well. And so um, if you're a person of faith, they'll call and they'll pray for you. They'll send you newsletters and updates and reach out if you need help. I mean, it was an incredibly personable experience. And this was before COVID, obviously. And so uh, I, I loved, loved, loved the way that I did college. I couldn't recommend it enough. I have friends that went and spent $250,000 on a four-year degree, and I just can't resonate with that. Uh, when, do, well, first of all, so you, you, you read the classics, John Locke and, and all of the other historically big brains. 
as far as current thinkers go, current political influences, who did you, I mean, you're still growing up, but who did you listen to in your teens, early 20s, um, in terms of modern voices to shape your politics? Yeah, there's a there's actually a book I want to recommend to everyone. Um, there's an author named Paul Johnson. He wrote a book called Modern Times. I read this book in, uh, this was probably about seven or eight years ago. Um, and it was incredibly transformative in uh, my understanding of the last 100 years and how we got where we are today. It's a little bit of a bigger book. It takes a longer time. I would encourage folks to sit down for six months and just kind of enjoy it. Don't feel the need to rush through it. It's about 850 pages. But Paul Johnson was a great thinker that informed a lot of how I view the bridge between politics and economics. Um, I've also loved some of the modern thinkers um, in, in sort of the uh, I, I don't know that I'd necessarily call it populist movement, but somewhat populist, uh, bringing power structures back to the people. That's that's sort of the anthem of populism. And there's some great thinkers that we all know and love, like Tucker Carlson, that's actually informed a lot of that thinking. In fact, I, I reflect on a great debate between, it was very cordial, but it was a debate between Tucker Carlson and Ben Shapiro probably about four or five years ago when they were talking about the new technological revolution and how uh, AI was going to either disrupt or complement the economy. And Tucker and Ben had two varying uh, theories on how we should see this new age of automation. And Tucker's goal was really to preserve local communities and to prioritize small businesses and to make sure that major sources of employment, especially for like non-college educated males, are preserved. So we talked about truck driving things. And that really resonated with my family who comes from trucking and farming. And so that was uh, really fascinating to me. I've, I've loved people over the years. Um, uh, honestly, like you guys, <laughs> what you're doing with Viva Barnes is, is really exciting. I like the law and how that incorporates to all of this as well. <laughs> Love it. Not a um, it's not a university, people. That's a joke. <laughs> yep. Um, no, it's, it's really cool. I've had a lot of neat influences. Um, there's, there's some business people as well. There's a gentleman named Dario DeLuca who does a lot in sort of the private equity thinking, trying to build communities. Um, so I actually got to mentor, I got to mentor underneath him for a little while. Uh, Dario actually was famous in Southern California as a private equity mogul who basically transformed a city. There was a city that was, uh, riddled with poverty and homelessness and a lot of corruption and crime. And he thought that real estate and business entrepreneurs would actually revitalize the city. That was the simple thesis. And it worked. And I got to watch that kind of happen and how he did it. So uh, really cool stuff. I could go on and on about the people that inspire me, but those are just a few. Okay, but we're going to do that and other stuff when we go to Rumble because we're going to, we're going to, what's the word? Give the benefit to the alternative market of ideas and sharing. So link to Rumble, people. I'm going to end this on YouTube right now as we do uh, remove, at the end on YouTube, remove. Okay, fine. Three, two, one, come on over to Rumble or go to locals, vivabarnslaw.locals.com. Ending.